There are plenty of limitations that hold us back from getting an accurate diagnosis. And, and the one that frustrates me the most is, is pulp testing, because that's where I base the lion's share of my treatment decisions. It, it, it comes from pulp testing. How does that tooth respond? What does it tell me when we test? Nothing is more frustrating to me than seeing a patient like this present with diffuse, increasing thermal symptoms, short duration, high intensity, and we test each of these teeth and they all respond in a very similar manner to cold. They all feel the cold. It's a relatively quick response. It doesn't linger. It dissipates immediately after removal of the stimulus. And what does that leave us? Well, it leaves me with a great sense of frustration because of course we're here to help these, these folks out. We wanna get them better. And yet it, it, in some of these instances, it's impossible to know what the right call is and what to do. So when I think about the, the, the limitations of pulp testing, it's important for me to remember that what I'm testing, when I test the nerve response, the A fiber and the C fiber response, I'm testing what the tooth feels, but not necessarily how healthy it is. What's the quality of the blood supply? So really it's more about sensibility testing rather than measuring the actual health of the dental pulp. And the bottom line is there's not a good correlation between the objective clinical signs and what's actually happening on the inside of the tooth. I've got a Mountain Dew going on the side here that, I, that I'll take a drink out of every now and again. And we see these patients that walk in and they've got deep decay throughout their mouth and they're completely asymptomatic. So we know there's going to be significant inflammation in those pulps, but yet there's no correlation in the amount of symptoms that that patient might experience. And of course, there's no proprioception in the dental pulp, which leads to confusion for patients about the point of origin. They come in with diffuse symptoms stating, I, I can't tell where it's coming from. And many of them say to me, you, you know, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I don't know where the pain is coming from. And yet it's there, it's increasing, it's keeping me awake at night. I can't do hot and cold. And yet they can't tell where it's coming from. And in my experience, that's commonplace. So when we think about Peterson et al. and the limitations of pulp testing, sensitivity is the ability to test the teeth that are diseased, to really look and see, is this pulp necrotic? And the bottom line is when cold was used, 83% of the time, cold would identify correctly a necrotic pulp. And when we think about that, how could we interpret that? Well, 83%, what does that really mean? It means that about 17% of the time, or just under one in five, there's actually disease present that we can't measure. And this is something that I experience in my clinical practice with frequency. Patient presents with symptoms, we do the testing, testing is inconclusive, and yet a day, two days, five days, however much time into the future, they're back saying, ah, now I know which one it is, right? So that disease was already there, but we're not sensitive enough to be able to pick it up. The good news on, on the sensitivity side of the ledger is that as the disease progresses, Hopefully we are going to be able to determine the exact cause and point of origin, and ultimately that should lead to an appropriate diagnosis and hopefully treatment. As opposed to the uh, specificity, which is our ability to measure teeth without disease. Are they healthy? So as we look here, 93% of teeth were correctly identified by both cold and EPT, identifying healthy pulps. So how can we read that? Well, 93%. From my perspective, that translates into 7% of the time, we're making the call that the tooth is in, in fact unhealthy when it is healthy, okay? So that means about 7% of the time, we're likely to be over treating the tooth. And if we think about that 7% and remember it for some stuff that I'll talk about later, that seems to make sense. Now, I, I hope my numbers are smaller than that. I want my testing to be redundant. I want it to be repeatable. I want to have several solid data points before making the call and saying this is endodontic in origin, but we don't always have that luxury. In many instances, we're basing this on a single or multiple thermal tests rather than really all the hard data that we would want to be able to make an appropriate call. If we think about the uh, uh, Martin Trope study, um, they looked at cold and EPT and they found 10% of teeth not responding to any tests containing vital pulps. But the interesting thing from my perspective on, on this particular study is their exclusion criteria. Uh, 
They excluded teeth that were heavily restored or had full coverage crowns, teeth with small pulp spaces, and teeth with moderate to severe pain. And from my perspective, that's my whole clinical practice. So if we're going to exclude all of those, their number, I, I think, would be considerably higher had they included those in their study set. So the bottom line, there's significant gaps in what we know from a pulp testing standpoint. And this is one of my favorite ones as a clinician because this gives me license to treat almost every tooth in many patients' mouths. If we look at Peters at all, in a mature, untraumatized tooth, if it doesn't respond to both cold and EPT, we should consider the pulp to be necrotic. Well, I see many patients in my practice where we put cold and or heat on multiple teeth throughout their mouth and they don't feel cold or heat on anything. And according to this study, it suggests that those teeth are necrotic, and I just don't believe that to be true. The symptomology doesn't su suggest that all of these teeth are necrotic. So filtering out the actual culprit from the ones that are healthy and viable becomes a very difficult needle to thread. And when we look at Seltzer Bender and Zients, the uh, triple O 1963, they basically determine that there's a great sense of inadequacy bordering on frustration when we can't predict the, the state of the dental pulp. And that's exactly what I feel in my clinical practice. So is there a correlation between histology and clinical diagnosis? Well, Rikuchi et al., this is the Journal of Endodontics 2014, they say that there is a reasonable correlation and that correct therapy can be guided, but they were looking at a study set of 32 cases, and what they found is that in 27 of these 32, or roughly 84%, there's a correlation. Well, from my perspective, 84% isn't good enough. I, I need more than a correlation. I need to get my diagnosis accurate more than 84% of the time. So clearly there are limitations when we're looking at the pulp testing of this. And then the question becomes, is the radiology something that we can use to add to what we know. And I think the answer is absolutely it is. Mm -hmm.